We have grown a number of rose seedlings over the years at Florida Southern College, and uh, numerous people have asked me how we go about doing that. Um, there are good other YouTube videos and websites around that tell how various people do the process. A lot of what I learned came from Texas A&M University's rose breeding program. I'll put a link to that down below, and I would recommend looking at their material. But I thought I would explain here how we have uh, bred roses and started roses from seed at Florida Southern. When you grow a named rose, let's say you have in your garden Peace and Mr. Lincoln and, and um, oh, Tiffany, those named varieties are all um, identical clones of each other. So all of the Mr. Lincolns in the world are genetically alike. They all came from one original seed way back when, and since then have been propagated by cuttings or by grafting or budding. And so that's vegetative propagation where you are multiplying a clone of a plant. When you grow roses from seed, because seeds are produced sexually, um, as is true in any organism, um, the offspring, while they may look a lot like their parents, they're not absolutely identical to the mother or the father. They are new individuals. And in the same way with, excuse me, with roses, um, each new rose is going to be, each seedling is going to be a new, different variety, never seen before. That's kind of an exciting concept. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a great percentage of those are going to be inferior to the parents. The parents probably got named and released because they were really good roses. And so the probability of getting something even better or even as good is not very high. Nevertheless, it's fun to try. And if you start enough seedlings, you're likely to find something that you do like. When you plant rose seeds, you're, you're taking the seeds out of those ripe hips, the fruits that form on the plant. And there are two ways you could go about that. You could use open pollinated seed that it's often referred to as OP, just the, the uh, 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 initials of open pollinated. That means that they were uh, pollinated by the bees and um, you don't really know what the male parent was. It just that pollen was brought in from somewhere, maybe one of your bushes, maybe a neighbor's bush, who knows? And so you know the female parent because that's what produced the hip, but you don't know the male parent. And you can get some interesting things from open pollinated seed and they're kind of fun to grow, but you can have a little more control over the uh, qualities of the offspring if you do purposeful crosses where you choose both the male and female parents and then you make the pollination the way you want that to happen. Then you know the full pedigree of those seeds. Much more predictable, although, as I said, every seedling is a new and, and different individual. And I think roses, even more than most other crop plants, are super variable. So you could cross two red roses then get a yellow rose. You could cross two fragrant roses and get one with no fragrance at all or a totally new and different fragrance. It's kind of bizarre. They have such variability in their genetics that you often get surprises, sometimes very good surprises, but it really is a gamble what you're going to get. If we look at the structure of a rose, this is just kind of a rough diagram of a cross section of a flower. Uh, in the very top center, you have a cluster of these little stringy things that are called pistils. Those are the female parts of the flower. And it says there are the knobs on top or stigmas. The stringy thing under them then is known as a style. And then at the very bottom, you have an ovary. So that whole unit right there is a, is a pistil. Here's another one, here's another one. And those are the female parts of the flower. So that's where we're gonna wanna put the pollen. And then outside of that, there is a ring of stamens. Those are the male parts. And they also have a little knob at the top known as an anther. It's most often yellow, although in a few roses it's a different color. And then it has this long stringy thing that attaches it known as a filament. Most roses make, oh, I'm gonna say 10 to 30, sometimes more, uh, pistols. And most of them will have a hundred or more stamens. There are huge numbers of stamens arranged in a ring 
around the female parts. And then petals, that's the big colorful part that is the reason we tend to grow roses. Uh, in a wild rose, usually five, occasionally four. In a cultivated rose, there could be over 100 of them. And then below that, those five green flaps that cover the uh, bud and eventually just kind of hang downward in an open flower. Those are sepals. And then that bulbous thing right under the flower is the receptacle. That's what's going to become the hip, the fruit. And then inside that, you have the bottoms of those uh, pistils, which is an ovary. And those will eventually grow up to become what we call rose seeds. They're not anatomically seeds. They're akines, which is a type of little fruitlet, um, very much like the so-called seeds in a strawberry, which are also not real seeds. But there is one seed inside each one of those. And so they look like seeds. We handle them like seeds. Each one of them produces one plant. We call them seeds. So that's just kind of the basic structure of a rose flower. So if you are going to do a purposeful pollination, you need to choose a male parent and a female parent. Your male parent is gonna be the source of the pollen. So in this case, I've chosen a flower of Mr. Lincoln. And this is about the right stage. It's not a tightly closed bud, but it's also not fully open. I wanna catch it before those anthers are ready to shed their pollen. So those are the, the uh, sepals right there, there's the petals, and then down inside where you can't see it are the stamens. So the first thing we're gonna do is peel away those petals. And on a very double plant like, like uh, Mr. Lincoln, there may be 50 or more of those, but you just slowly and carefully peel them away until you've got rid of all of them. So now what we're seeing there is a ring of stamens, the bright yellow ones, those are the male parts. And then these kind of pinkish white ones in the middle are the pistils, that's the female parts. So what I want to do now is with a scissors or some other cutting device, I want to carefully clip away. I hope you can see my cursor there. I want to clip away those stamens into a container. And so there's a pile of stamens I've just collected. And I'm going to leave those overnight. Sometimes it takes two days. It depends on the temperature and the humidity. But you want them to dry out. And as they dry, uh, they will shed the pollen. You don't want it in a very windy place because the pollen will blow away. So put it in some place that's um, uh, very quiet or cover it with something. And you can see here, I've shaken this around a little and there's that pale yellow dust. That's the pollen that's coming out. This is ready to use now. So now I'm ready to select a female parent. And of course, I'm gonna leave that flower on the plant because it has to grow up and become a hip. So I picked one that is uh, kind of a similar situation to the male parent I chose. I want it to be an opening bud, not the whole way open yet, but also loose enough that I can easily get the petals off of it. I'm gonna peel away all the petals, just like I did for the male parent. I've got the same situation here. I have a ring of stamens surrounding the pistils. And once again, I'm gonna carefully clip away those stamens, but this time I'm gonna throw them away, just discard them because what I wanna keep are those female stigmas, stigmas in the center. And that's, it's actually easier than you would think. It looks like they're all just a hodgepodge there, but actually in most roses, there's a nice neat ring of stamens surrounding the pistils. And if you aim your uh, scissors right, you can cut them cleanly and do no damage to those pistils at all. If you have to practice by your second or third rows, you'll be an expert. So there you can see I've, I've cleaned away the stamens from the front part. These are all pistols right here. I still need to catch the stamens going around the sides. And there it is, I'm finished. I've taken all the stamens out. That, that guarantees that I'm not going to get any pollen from this flower back onto itself. All the pollen I use is going to be the pollen that I want to put there from that pollen that I collected yesterday. Now, some people at this point wait a few hours, even overnight, before they pollinate it. Um, I was told by friends who, who pollinate their roses, there's no reason not to do it right away. So I tend to do it right away. At that point, you take your clean, dry finger and you just wipe up a little bit of that pollen out of your pollen container. 
And there you can see on that finger, it's kind of a dusty yellow. I've picked up some of that pollen. You can use a paintbrush or a Q-tip if you want, but I tend to use my finger. And then just very gently daub that onto the tops of those stigmas. You don't want to really press down because you might break them or bruise them. So just, just very lightly tap it. And um, each stigma that you touch with pollen has the potential to become one seed. So if you want a lot of seeds in that hip, it's important to hit most of those stigmatic surfaces. Once you've done that, put a label on it and, and with the, the name of the male parent, we already know the female parent because this thing is gonna remain connected to it, but I need to remember what my male parent was and then the date that I made the pollination and then you just let it grow. If you wanna be sure that the bees or something else don't pollinate that with some other pollen at this point, you might cover it with a little bit of netting or a paper bag or something for a couple days. I usually do these in the greenhouse where I don't have a lot of bees, so I don't worry about that. But that's something you might consider if you're doing this out in the garden and you've got a lot of bees moving pollen around because they're not as attracted to this flower as they would have been if it had the petals on it. It probably doesn't have much smell to it anymore. It's not pretty. Still, there's always the chance that there's going to be some foreign pollen that comes in there if you don't try to prevent that. So there it is from the side. And then we just leave that there for about 100 days. Uh, a few roses will ripen ahead of time. Uh, some of them ahead of that, some of them take a little longer. Uh, some people wait precisely 100 days. Other people wait for the hip to change color. Most hips will turn yellow or orange or red. And at that point, then you're ready to harvest. So this is just a. a several slides of various types of hips and what they look like when they're ready. So this is Rosa moisei. Uh, I don't remember the species here. I took this picture at a botanic garden in Alaska, actually. So it's a cold hardy variety. Um, this is Rosa spinosissima from a picture was actually taken in Scotland. It makes black hips. This is Rosa rugosa, which makes a red hip. A lot of plants make yellow hips. I've been told, and I do believe it, that you don't have to wait till they've reached their full color. If, as long as they're changing from green to the other color, uh, you can use them with some, some green still on them. And some people even say, you'll get better germination if you don't wait till they're fully ripe. I do tend to wait until they're fully ripe. I don't have any good reason for doing that. It's just what I do. So after, you've, after they're at least 100 days old or they've colored thoroughly, you can harvest them and cut them open. The seeds are quite hard, so you don't have to worry too much about damaging them with your knife. You can just slice right into that and won't hurt anything. And then you just, I usually use the tip of the knife and I just dig out the seeds. They're kind of creamy white. Sometimes they're brown. They're about, oh, half the size of an apple seed up to maybe apple seed size. And you'll get anywhere from one to sometimes 30 or more of them in one hip, depending on the variety and how successful the cross was. So then what I do is I take a, a paper towel and I fold it up into a little pad and get it quite wet, not dripping anymore, but definitely wet. And then I space the seeds out on the surface of that paper towel. That's gonna keep them damp. And then I used to wrap them up in the towel, but now I just put them on the surface because I wanna be able to look at them to see when they start sprouting without having to unwrap the whole package. So I carefully slip that whole thing into a Ziploc bag label it with the day's date as well as what the seeds are that I'm planting. In this case, it was an open pollinated rugosa, but had I made the cross, I would have said the name of the female parent, cross sign or X, name of the male parent. And then I put that into the um, vegetable bin of the refrigerator. Stratification is a process that's used for seeds on plants that are, are adapted to living through a winter. They don't want their seeds to sprout during the winter. And roses are certainly in that group of plants. And so what we're gonna do for those seeds, there, there are some roses that if you plant the seeds, they'll grow immediately, but that's kind of rare. Most roses need a stratification period. So that means they have to be cold and wet for a period of time. And so they're wet because they're on those wet paper towels. I put them in the vegetable bit of, vegetable bin of the refrigerator. My refrigerator is right at about 37 degrees Fahrenheit. And you just leave them there for at least 90 days. You can leave them longer than that if you need to. But usually at about 90 days, I start taking them out and looking at them now and then. And if I see any sprouting, 
those seeds are ready to plant. Uh, if they're not, you can put them back in the fridge for another 10 days and check them again. And after about 120 days, um, some seeds might take longer than that, but usually 120 is enough for most crosses. You can take them all out, whether they're sprouting or not, and go ahead and plant them. And at that point, then the seeds should start coming up in, oh, two to four weeks later. Sometimes they take longer, but usually you'll get at least a few in that first month after you sow them. The stuff that we sow them in, I used to use just pots of regular potting media, and I had a horrible problem with my seedlings rotting because the soil was staying too wet for too long. They'd get damping off where they rot right at the soil line. And so I've tried using the potting soil and drenching them now and then with Captan fungicide. That works quite well. Um, I've also tried putting them just on the surface of the soil and then covering them with perlite, which is very well drained and it starts out sterile. Uh, a friend of mine in California told, suggested that, and that does seem to work well. I've also tried just planting them in pure vermiculite, which is a sterile medium to start with. And with that, I have also done the Captan drench, and that seems to also work well. But uh, even so, we tend to lose some of them to rotting early on, usually within the first couple weeks after they sprout. So once we see the sprouts, we're gonna drench them either with more Captan or if you wanted to go more of a natural or organic route, you could use root shield. That's a biological um, control for fungi. I find that it doesn't work quite as well as the captan, but it does work. It's certainly better than nothing. And, um, and it's, a, it's a living uh, fungus in its own right, but it's a fungus that protects the, your plant rather than allows them to become damaged. So after three or four weeks, this is one of the groups that I planted in in uh, perlite and they are sprouting. We will leave them there then for um, several weeks. They, if they're too crowded, I'm, I might thin them out, but I usually try to leave them in that planting tray um, to get them well started. They'll make a few leaves and then usually within six weeks, they'll make a flower. And so uh, you can kind of have some idea at that point whether they're worth keeping or not. That first flower is often quite different from later flowers. So if there's any inkling that it might be okay, um, it's probably worth keeping it and letting it bloom again. But once they flower, then you can carefully remove those and transfer them to individual pots and then grow them on to be normal rose bushes. You'll find that a lot of them start out as, as singles and, the, and if they're totally single, exactly five petals, they probably won't make any more petals later. If they're slightly double like this, this has, what is it, nine or 10 petals probably, that may become somewhat more double with age. And if they're very double when you start, they're likely to stay double. Um, if you like single flowered roses, then you might wanna save some of those. This is one that I really like because it was deep red with the black edges. So I named that for my dad, George Manners, and it's quite a nice little rose. But in most cases, people are not looking for the uh, five petal types, they want more doubling. Here's another seedling we had that, that uh, I like the colors. It has a deep, rich damask scent, which is nice. And so this is one that we're carrying on for another year to see if it improves and if we continue to like it. So anyway, that is uh, the method that we use uh, on our roses. Uh, there are other methods people use, but in general, it involves collecting pollinating if you're going to do that, and then collecting seeds from a ripe hip. Most people do stratify them in a refrigerator, or if you're up north, uh, plant them outside and let the natural winter do that. But in most cases, they're going to need some winter before they sprout, and then plant them and be careful not to let them rot from damping off. Another good thing to do there is to have a medium that drains very well and let it get almost dry between waterings. You don't want to wilt them, but that drying out can really help prevent with the prevent the fungus diseases as time goes on. So anyway, I hope that's helpful.